out a mobile phone with them. All right, pull out your mobile phone, pull out a web, web browser, get connected to the internet, go to jackbox.tv and type in the code PLSN. Jackbox.tv, as you can see up there. <laughs> How's it going? Is the uh, internet's working here? So the four-letter code it asks for is PLSN. And you can lie about your name if you want, I don't care. Nah, just type, the, the interface will do that for you. Then hit the play button. All right, somebody hit the play button, thank you. Here we go, so, pick a category. Somebody is picking a category. I think. All right, here's a thing. Armadillos are the number one cause of car accidents in New Mexico. If you're playing along, click the truth or lie button. Whichever one you think it is, is it truth or is it a lie? All right, waiting for everybody to join in. 18 players are in, everybody's in. Let's find out, it's a lie. Um, All right, here we go. What's the code? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that code? <laughs> All right, saxophone was banned in Nazi Germany for being too sexy, truth or a lie? There we go, four players are in. Where's the rest of your 10? All right, that was true. How many people got that right? There we go. Tom was the fastest. Gets an extra 75 points. All right, we're going to stop this game. How fun was that? Oh, come on. How fun was that? That's better. That is an example of a, of a, uh, onli a um, online game. All right? Now, sure, it's not Doom. It's not, I don't know, what's the, what do we play these days? Call of Duty or anything like that? No? But it is an online ga multiplayer game. Um, hang on, you guys are still playing, aren't you? <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> are you sure you want to exit? Yes. That's supposed to be listening to me. Don't connect. All right, let's have a look. Let's jump over and start looking at some more boring stuff, like code. Sorry, bear with me while we pull this up. We're going to look today at how we could create a game just like the uh, Lie Swatter game that we uh, just played there. And I'm going to break all the rules um, of giving a talk at a meetup by sitting down first and secondly, demoing live code. <laughs> they say don't work with animals, children or live code. I've got no animals or children here, but let's go with some live code. What we're going to be looking at is, um, is a, just a quick run through of Ratchet. So R-A-T-C-H-E-T. Um, can everybody see that? Cool. Um, this is PHP Storm, what we were talking about before. Um, so as you can see, it edits code. It does a whole pile of other things as well as we go. Um, but I just want to take you through um, Ratchet and how it works um, and how we could create a game like LiceWatter using Ratchet. Um, I've got a whole pile of um, tabs open. I don't need, th don't need them all. I've just, rather than typing code, I've just created multiple uh, versions of the same file. So if we have a look here, this is, this is a basic app, um, a very basic app that does absolutely nothing. But in Ratchet, you create, you, you, um, create a message component interface, um, and in there, you put your functions. So four functions we care about, the open function, the message function, the close function, and the error function. So if we think about that, what, what's going to happen here, the open function is when you connected to jackbox.tv and typed in your name and that code. It then <coughs> opened a web socket to Jackbox, um, and the on open would have fired at that point there. When you clicked truth or lie, that would have sent a message. And so the message uh, method there would have been called. When I shut down the game in order to get your attention, that would have sent the close message. 
And if there'd been some error along the way, of course, then as we can probably all guess from the name of the method, the error method there would have been called. So this, this gives us the ability to create games just like we saw Lysewater in PHP. Um, we start off with just something, some simple framework like that, and then we start to chuck some uh, extra code in it. So let's open up the next version. So as you can see now, we've started to put some uh, some extra stuff in this. Um, we've declared ourselves a uh, some clients and created a construct method. So in the construct method, we're just declaring what clients is. So it's just going to be an SPL ob object storage that we can chuck objects into, and then we've fleshed out each of the uh, the methods that we saw of before. So when we when a new connection is opened, this method gets called here, and what we're going to do is we're going to attach the new connection to our clients. Um, so now we, we know there's another client listening and we've just attached him to the list of clients. Um, this here is just debugging so that we can see on our uh, console that somebody else has connected. And then we're going to send a message to that connection saying, welcome, you are user, and then a resource ID. So this is like standard PHP resource ID. It's going to be a number, all right? And that's, that's all the open method is going to do. When somebody creates a new connection to us, we are going to tell the... Um, the console that a there's a new connection, and we're going to send a welcome message to that person. Let's uh, let's run some code. All right, here we go for server one. So this is now running. Um, nothing happens in the console here. This is not a web script, so uh, uh, you know a lot of us are used to PHP being something that happens um, on the web. Um, we'll get onto some web stuff in a minute that's nothing to do with PHP, but nevertheless, this is, this is running on a server. So we're now running this, um, this server that we just created there, and if we connect to it here, it tells us, as you can see there, welcome, you are user 29. So we've now connected to that server we just created, and it's told us we are user 29. If we jump over into another tab and open another one, we can see that we are now user 39, so another resource ID. Um, so random, yeah, well not random, but we're just getting back a resource ID, and that's all we've done so far in our app. Let's just jump back into the code and see what happens next. When somebody closes the connection, all that we're going to do is we're going to detach them from our clients. So, you know, they've closed the connection. We no longer want to remember they ever existed. Um, they are dead to us. Um, how dare they close the connection? And we'll tell the console that the uh, connection has been closed. So let's just jump over here and close one of these connections. And if we jump back into our console where we were running it here, we can see down here, um, sorry, it's so low. Can everybody kind of see that? Or do I need to try and change the size of the screen? Let's try that. All right. Is that easy to see? So it tells us that connection 39 has disconnected. So that was the close method being called there. The other client that we've got connected um, here, number 29, is still connected. So all, all 39 did was say, I'm, I'm sick of this game, I'm going home. So their method, their, the close method got called for them, and we detached them from the list of connections. Um, and then if there's an error, we've just, all we're going to do if there's an error is we're going to log it to the console, and we're going to close that connection. Um, the other method in that we need to flesh out is the on message. Now that's where we get to put some awesome comp complex stuff, all right? Everything that we've talked about here is the kind of bootstrapping level where we deal with a new connection coming, um, an old connection disappearing, um, er and errors um, occurring. Um, it's, it, that's all the pretty simple bootstrap stuff. Let's jump in to app two, which is the next one <coughs> in a second. Now, in order to make things easier, I just subclassed app one and added the on message so we don't have to look at all the other code. Um, and so we can see in the on message here, we get a message from one of our clients. The parameters here is the client that sent us the message and the message they sent us. What we're going to do is we're going to loop over all the clients we've got in our um, collection of clients. And if it's not the client that's talking to us, we're going to send them the message the client told us. So like a typical chat program, I say, hello. I don't need to tell me that I said hello, because that's me, but I want to tell everybody else that's connected hello. Um, and so 
very simple here. We now kind of, basically we do, have a chat program that allows us to chat amongst um, ourselves. Of course, it's all very, very rudimentary because it won't even tell us who's saying it. All we're doing is sending the actual message that we got. Um, but let's run that. Connect back to it from our two windows here. And if this window here says, hello, then we can jump back into our other connection and we can see the hello has been sent there. So this is user 30, which received the message. I am user 30. In our other tab over here, which is user 40, we see the message, I am user 30. So all of a sudden, we've got a running chat program. As simple as that, you can actually run a chat program. Now, of course, I'm using Telnet to talk to this. Um, so, you know, this is not a chat program for your mum, um, unless your mum knows how to tell that. Um, but nevertheless, it's a chat program. And what's really cool is it's an anonymous chat program. So you can talk to people anonymously, um, which is not really a feature. It's just because we haven't got to that bit of the uh, run through yet. Um, let's just jump out of that. Yep. See, not only can your mum not tell that, I can't tell that. And we can see back over here that new connection, then our two connections have uh, disconnected. So let's, let's go one step further in this and deal with the actual message and get a bit, um, a bit, a bit more complex with it. So in our next one here, um, now I don't promise that any of my code is the best possible code. I'm not saying follow my style or anything like that. This is more just code that's there to uh, give you a run through. So if you happen to see interpolated SQL or anything like that in the code, you won't. But if you did, um, then please don't copy that. Uh, this is just, uh, just an example on uh, what to do. So what we're going to do here is in our on message, rather than assume it's text, we're going to assume that the message we receive is actually just on. So we're not just going to get a, uh, a text that says hello, we're going to get a packet from the user uh, that just on that we are going to then react to. Now, per my disclaimer just before, nothing checks to make sure that it really is just on that we got. Nothing is checking to uh, make sure it's parsable. Nothing's checking anything at all here. We're just assuming for the sake of this that we're getting, uh, that we're getting actual the kind of data we want. Um, we then pull a something out of that JSON called command, um, and then we go into a switch statement here that lets us deal with the command. So each JSON chunk we're going to get has got a command in it. So let's just jump back to our, our lice water. The command we get might be, to, it might be an answer, right? And so the JSON packet we get back has got command answer, and then the answer we're getting is true. So that might be what we got back was command answer, answer, true. Um, and so we then in, so in the switch here, we can deal with the different things. Just to keep going, with, we'll keep going with the chat paradigm because um, it's not a bad one to, uh, to understand what's happening. So the commands we get here might be a message. Um, and in fact, anything else is going to hit the default here where we're going to send back a uh, malformed request um, error to the, uh, to the person who sent us the JSON packet. Um, so the only thing we're implementing is message. And all we're going to do in message down here in handle message is we're going to do exactly what we did before, but rather than sending back the message we got, we're going to create our own JSON packet, which tells the, all the clients that we're in OK status, they don't need to show an error. There's a message, and that message is the message we got from the data packet that we got earlier. Um, and the person that we're getting it from is the resource ID. So now we're no longer an anonymous chat, all right? Now when we run it, we have to send something more complex. We have to send the JSON. But the message we're going to get back will give us an identifying information as to which user it was. Now, of course, it's resource ID 29. And trying to work out who that is, you're going to have to walk around the office and keep asking people, are you resource ID 29? Okay? So we've got a bit of a problem there. But nevertheless, it's no longer anonymous. The somebody that said something and was user 29 is going to be user 29 um, a second later. Um, so let's run this. Uh, what are we in three? Here's a message I prepared earlier. So in here we are going to connect our two users. So there's user thirty and user forty. 
So over here in user 30, they're going to send the message, hello world. Ah, we're missing something. Does anybody else notice what we're missing? We need to tell the uh, server that we are actually sending a message, otherwise we'll get a uh, error packet back. Oh, still didn't like it. What did I mess up? Ah, uh, yeah, to be formal, just on your right. But does uh, PHP actually care? We'll find out while I'm typing live code in front of a user group. What have I done? All right. Okay, this is why you don't do live code in front of user groups. Because uh, it doesn't like what we're sending back. Let's just have a quick look here. We're getting the command from it, and the command is message. Clearly, I've broken something. All right, let's pretend that worked. How awesome was that? <laughs> yeah! <laughs> All right, so, excellent. So, we're one step further, as I said. We're now no longer sending anonymous messages. Um, the, but, of course, they're kind of still anonymous. So, let's, let's uh, do something else. Let's jump in here to another... Um, another version, and we've added into our, so this is all exactly the same code as before, except I've added a new command into our switch statement, so we can now handle the nick command. Now this is not a command exclusively for people named nick, so that we don't have to create a command for everybody. Um, this is short for nickname. That was a joke. <laughs> oh God. Ben, I'm scared of doing slideshow karaoke now. So, uh, oh, uh -oh. <laughs> talk faster. <laughs> All right. So we've now created a new method in here called handle Nick. Um, I'm not going to make the joke. <laughs> um, in here, what we're going to do is we're, we've added up the top here a new um, array of connection nicknames. Now, all it is going to do is map connection IDs to the nickname that the person sent across to us. Um, and so down here, we look to see if they've got an old nickname. If they don't have an old nickname, then we're going to say their old nickname was their resource ID. So that, you know, they connected as user 40. We said user 40 is connected. Now we're going to say user 40 is now known as Rick. Um, we get the new nick from the JSON data that we got. Um, we go and set, we then set the connection nicknames for that resource ID to the nickname we got. And then once again, we jump through all the clients, including the one who sent us the nick and say that the um, nickname is now known, the old nick is now known as new nick. Um, the reason that we want to do that for all clients, normally in a chat program, is you want to confirm to the user who's wanted to change their nickname that their nickname has changed. Um, so you normally just send back um, a message like that and every client then updates their uh, nickname list with the, uh, with the change of nickname. Um, our handle message is exactly the same, there's nothing new in there. Um, do you want to risk it? All right. All right. All right. I'm going to do it. Let's copy that. What are we in for? Yep, wrong one. For. All right. It executed successfully. Let's see if we can connect to it here. Yep. User 30 there. User 40 there. User 30 is going to issue a nickname change. Oh. We were that close. <laughs> um, this did work previously. Um, so let's just pretend it worked now. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> um, so all, all, this is, all this is very good. And you, you can see, I mean, apart from the code, um, it's all very good. Um, but you can see from doing this that you can add in a whole pile of commands because the command has got nothing to do with, I I with a chat message. The command is just a JSON packet that's coming across that if it worked, um, would take a particular action. And so we can, we can add in whatever actions we want to add in, whether it's somebody giving us an answer of a truth or a lie or, um, or any other kind of message that we want to pass between different systems, um, we can do that. Now, what we've been running here is we've been running this um, on the command line um, and, run and connecting through it through Telnet. Um, this here is the uh, command line script that I'm running. Um, 
we, it, it, uh, we just set everything up here and the server that we're setting up here just uses the uh, IO server factory and creates a, um, an app on port 8081. Um, which is nothing except that it opens, a, it opens port 8081 on the local machine for listening. Um, so if you do want to run a chat program as we've been looking at so far, you'll have to bring all your friends over to your computer so they can all type messages to each other and take it in terms of reading their messages. Um, it's a highly inefficient chat program. Um, it's probably easier just to talk to them. Um, so let's make it one, one step uh, more complex um, and have a look at the real uh, usage. And that's here. And you can see that we've become massively more complex in here. Um, all we've done is in our server factory is we've created a HTTP server so that we can now talk to our server that we created before, exactly the same server, via HTTP. That HTTP server is going to be a WebSocket server so that we can talk using WebSockets um, across that HTTP connection. <laughs> That's okay, we went from 10 to 7 and I'm nearly done. We might make it. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Um, and then we just run our, uh, we, we, we instantiate our, uh, our application um, and then run it down the bottom. So that's as simple as this is. So you can see that by creating some pretty simple code that we've managed to go through in just half a, uh, a meetup here, we've been able to create some, some fairly, you know, um, apart from the fact it doesn't work, um, some fairly um, capable um, code. Now, you might not want to create a Jackbox type game like we played before. You might want to use this for something, um, you know, more serious. Um, there are plugins into Ratchet for using um, message queues and other things like that. Um, so you can publish messages to a queue that Ratchet will then read off the queue and then distribute to clients that have subscribed to that kind of message. Um, and so by using that, you connect your message queue to your WebSocket and thus your clients who happen to be using your web app are getting data that's coming off the uh, message queue. So you can create a message queue and throw info on it, and it'll go out to anybody that's subscribed to that in really not much code at all. Um, let's go and risk life, limb, and reputation and try running this in WebSocket mode. All right, good so far. All right, so the, uh, the, the code in this, there's nothing real special about it. Um, the code that's in these, um, that's running these things here is just really straight HTML and JavaScript. You'd, you'd need to learn how to create a WebSocket in JavaScript. Um, that's outside what I want to talk about tonight. Um, I'll make all this code available. I'll, set, I'll get the link out um, somehow. Um, but I'll make the code available so that you can uh, actually grab it. All right, <laughs> it looks like it's working this time. Look, <laughs> resource 93 is now known as Rick. <laughs> so what this did in the background <laughs> is, uh, is send, a, um, send a nick command across to us. Um, so the web app sent a nick command across to the uh, back end system um, and then it published it to all the listeners. Um, hi, this is Nigel. Can we jump over here and look at that Yay. in the rig window. <laughs> um, and of course, being the fact that this is actually a web app, um, it no longer is stuck on your machine. So you and Nigel don't have to stand at your machine typing to each other. You can run this exact code without any changes at all because it runs perfectly and it's wonderfully safe code. <laughs> <laughs> on your company intranet. <laughs> And I promise there's no bad code in there and I won't hack anything. Um, but yeah, you can see here that we've managed to create a, a chat app system that allows us to change nicknames um, very simply. Now, of course, I could do all kinds of other things on this um, interface here, like color buttons that could then, you know, tell everybody to change color um, of their screen. And so all of a sudden when I click the red button, everybody's screen goes red. Um, you know, or whatever I wanted to do on there. I could make it play a sound on everybody's computer and really annoy everybody. Um, it doesn't have to be a chat program, as a, like, like we saw with the Jackbox game, you know. We can create a game out of this 
uh, kind of thing. Most of that Jackbox game was not the, the server that ran it. We've just seen most of the server that would have run a game like that. Uh, of course, it'll have a bit more safety in the front of the checker. Um, but nevertheless, it's exactly that same concept there. It's got a front end on it that gives us some flashy looking um, animated buttons and all that kind of thing, but under the hood, that's what it is. Um, and I can't wait to find out what games we're going to create in the next month. Um, one game that, um, the actual, actually, the, what led to me thinking about this and looking at this was actually the concept of giving away our monthly PHP Storm license. Because what I want to do is I want to use this to create an app where you go to URL um, and type your name in it, and then everybody holds up their phone, and this will send a flash red message to one person at a time around the room. Um, so everybody's, everybody's phone will be flashing red, um, or whatever the wind color happens to be, um, like a roulette wheel spinning around, you know, slowly it slows down, and people say, oh, I'm going to win this thing, and slowly slows down, until finally one person is left with a big wind message on their phone. Um, what we've seen here, it's not going to be difficult to extend this to be able to do that, um, because it is just a case of being able to send messages uh, between the clients um, and, uh, and create a, an app that you know, can be uh, anything we want to do, whether it's something silly and fun like the lice water or the, uh, the uh, license giveaway, or whether it's something uh, more complex uh, like being able to use it in a uh, in an actual corporate app that is able to send messages uh, between the server and the um, client without doing uh, our normal polling where we continually uh, bootstrapping and making requests of the server, we're uh, c constantly connected to it. I think I've managed to do it without running out of battery. <laughs> Good one, Dell. Um, any questions? Uh, any any quick questions out of that? Oh, sorry, I'll start with Chogger if you could. No, oh, all right, we'll go there. Oh, how much of my batteries left? Well, let's ask the the, uh, the big questions. Let's check. Oh, I've got a big red X on it. Still seven percent. Oh, how's that? It cost us zero percent to do that last. <laughs> yeah. I met my wife in IRC, oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> and I've still got the chat transcript from it. Oh. Yeah, I was reciting song lyrics. <laughs> that was uh, January 28, 2000, so I, I'll, I'll blame it on my youth. <laughs> Sorry, chocolate here. Um, it, I'm not. I couldn't. T I can't tell you how that goes, but the main limit you will find is the U-limit on the user running the script. So U-limit in Linux is typically 1024, so you can connect 1024 clients to it and it, according to the documentation, that's the normal limit that people hit. Now of course, if every one of those um, clients is sending and receiving very large messages, then you're probably going to end up with a bit of a problem in there, but, um, but yeah, it doesn't tend to, it, the resource according to the documentation uh, is the U-limit more than uh, anything else? Yeah, go for it. So the um, issue with this one is that uh, if you look at that one uh, project that you mentioned, and uh, I can imagine that you've got you know six or seven other clients that you want to be able to interact with. Um, so you know, you know, some of them might be the same sort of uh, uh, client that you've used in the past, and some of them might be the same sort of tool. And I can't imagine that you've got six or seven people running on those different tools at the same time. So how do you get them to work? How do you handle the fact that you know one might be the same sort of tool as the other? Um, so the question's about, um, can you run this for a long time without it um, falling over? Um, the answer to that is that I think we've managed to go for about three minutes so far. So, um, so uh, sorry, I can't, I can't answer that, but it is designed to be running long for a long period. Um, whether it's got memory leaks because it's running PHP or anything like that, I'm not sure. I haven't had to run, I didn't have to install any extra C libraries or anything like that. Um, I just used Composer to install um, Ratchet. Um, it installed the uh, its dependencies, of course, um, and was up and running. Um, yeah, I haven't I haven't looked at that, but it is being used by uh, you know in in large cases. Um, if yeah, it's a case of dealing with it. If you start to find memory leaks, then start with your code. I would suggest be <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah, go for it. So the 
so the security model um, of Ratchet itself um, doesn't exist. Um, Ratchet's not designed to have a security model or anything like that. It's like a web server. Um, it connects. It accepts the connection that it gets unless it doesn't. Um, so you, you got a firewall in front of it. Firewall off uh, um, things that you don't want connecting to it. Once they connect to it, if for some reason you don't want that connection for some reason, then you can just close that connection. Um, you know, if, if you want to implement a password command, you can implement a password command and close the connection if somebody gets a password wrong. Um, it does, it's, it's totally agnostic, just like running Apache or any other server. It's up to the user to create any further security on that. Yes. Have you run it in production? Have I run it in production? Um, I'm not sure if you count a user group as production, but if you do, then yes. Um, no, I haven't run it in uh, in like in a corporate um, production case. Oh, no. Oh, okay. I guess the second part of the question is that can you protect contact between the user and the user? Yes. Or? Yes. In 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 Linux, you just increase your U limit on whichever user you want to um, increase it as, yeah. or if depending on how your resources are going, you might want to spin up another server to, you know, to be able to deal with another ten twenty four um, connections. Um, you know, it's the number of connections is limited by the machine. Um, one server can have 1024 by default unless you increase your U limit, um, but there's nothing stopping you from creating another server on a different port okay. um, and just telling the client, rather than connecting to, 10 uh, to 8081, to connect to 8082 or whatever you happen to, uh, to decide to do. Sorry, could you say that again, Shanga? Yes, yeah, true. Um, yeah, so Chongo's saying you can create a server that all you do is connect to it and it tells you which server to connect to. Um, so, you know, you're basically creating a, 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 a load, a load balancing uh, server in the front of everything um, uh, without actually working for Jackbox and knowing how they work. That page that we went to where we type in our name yeah. um, and the code, maybe that code then in the response, in the, um, here we go. Um, <laughs> Um, in the, the, when we type in that code and hit submit, um, it probably sends us back on the resulting HTML page which server to connect to. Um, and so, um, for, the, for example, that game that we played there, um, that will take up to 100 users um, in that game. So they're only running things that accept 100 users at a time um, there, <coughs> but that, whether that's technical or whether it's just a gameplay thing, you know, I'm not sure. Okay, one more question, then I'll... Uh uh, so the, the question is whether everything's running on a single thread or whether it's um, forking and creating um, multiple threads in there. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not... I, I can't answer that, but it would be very easy to, to go and check the um, Ratchet um, page um, to find that out. Cool. I'm going to stop answering questions there. Um, so check the Ratchet website for any more details about that. What we've gone through today um, is based on the Hello World um, app that's on um, the Ratchet website. Um, but as I said, I'll chuck all the code for all the, the f uh, five different versions um, that I did that we went through today. I'll chuck all those up on a, um, on a Bitbucket um, repo um, and then you can uh, browse it, check it out, fork it send me code review notes, um, whatever you want to do. Thank you.